Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Read aloud by Ms. Love. Chapter 15. The days had folded into one another and mixed so that after two or three weeks, he only knew time had passed in days because he made a mark for each day in the stone near the door to his shelter. Real time he measured in events. A day was nothing, not a thing to remember. It was just sun coming up, sun going down, and some light in the middle. But events, events were burned into his memory, and so he used them to remember time, to know and to remember what had happened, to keep a mental journal. There had been the day of first meet. That had been a day that had started like the rest, up after the sun, clean the camp, and make sure there's enough wood for another night. But it was a long time, a long time of eating fish and looking for berries, and he craved more, craved more food, heavier food, deeper food. He craved meat. He thought in the night now of meat, thought of his mother's cooking a roast or dreamed of turkey, and one night he awakened before he had to put wood on the fire with his mouth making saliva and the taste of pork chops in his mouth. So real, so real, and all a dream. But it left him intent on getting meat. He had been working farther and farther out for wood, sometimes now going nearly a quarter of a mile away from camp for wood, and he saw many small animals. Squirrels were everywhere, small red ones that chattered at him and seemed to swear and jumped from limb to limb. There were also many rabbits, large gray ones with a mix of reddish fur, smaller, fast gray ones that he saw only at dawn. The larger ones sometimes sat until he was quite close, then bounded and jerked two or three steps before freezing again. He thought if he worked at it and practiced, he might hit one of the larger rabbits with an arrow or a spear. Never the small ones or the squirrels. They were too small and fast. Then there were the fool birds. They exasperated him to the point where they were close to driving him insane. The birds were everywhere, five and six in a flock, and their camouflage was so perfect that it was possible for Brian to sit and rest, leaning against a tree, with one of them standing right in front of him in a willow clump, two feet away, hidden, only to explode into deafening flight just when Brian least expected it. He just couldn't see them, couldn't figure out how to locate them before they flew, because they stood so perfectly still and blended in so perfectly well. And what made it worse was that they were so dumb, or seemed to be so dumb, that it was almost insulting the way they kept hidden from him. Nor could he get used to the way they exploded up when they flew. It seemed like every time he went for wood, which was every morning, he spent the whole time jumping and jerking in fright as he walked. On one memorable morning, he had actually reached for a piece of wood, what he thought to be a pitchy stump at the base of a dead birch, his fingers close to touching it, only to have it blow up in his face. But on the day of first meet, he had decided the best thing to try for would be a fool bird, and that morning he had set out with his bow and spear to get one, to stay with it until he got one and ate some meat not to get wood, not to find berries, but to get a bird and eat some meat. At first, the hunt had not gone well. He saw plenty of birds working up along the shore of the lake to the end, then down the other side, but he only saw them after they flew. He had to find a way to see them first, see them and get close enough to either shoot them with the bow or use the spear, and he could not find a way to see them. When he had gone halfway around the lake and had jumped up 20 or so birds, he finally gave up and sat at the base of a tree. He had to work this out, see what he was doing wrong. There were birds there and he had eyes. He just had to bring the two things together. Looking wrong, he thought. I am looking wrong. More, more than that, I am being wrong somehow. I'm doing it the wrong way. 
fine sarcasm came into his thoughts. I know that. Thank you. I know I'm doing it wrong, but what is right? The morning sun had cooked him until it seemed his brain was frying, sitting by the tree, but nothing came until he got up and started to walk again and hadn't gone two steps when a bird got up. It had been there all the time while he was thinking about how to see them right next to him, right there. He almost screamed. But this time, when the bird flew, something caught his eyes, and it was the secret key. The bird cut down toward the lake, then, seeing it couldn't land in the water, turned and flew back up the hill into the trees. When it turned, curving through the trees, the sun had caught it, and Brian, for an instant, saw it as a shape sharp pointed in front, back from the head in a streamlined bullet shape to the fat body. Kind of like a pear, he had thought, with a point on one end and a fat little body, a flying pear. And that had been the secret. He had been looking for feathers, for the color of the bird, for a bird sitting there. He had to look for the outline instead, had to see the shape instead of the feathers or color, had to train his eyes to see the shape. It was like turning on a television. Suddenly he could see things he never saw before. In just moments, it seemed, he saw three birds before they flew, saw them sitting, and got close to one of them, moving slowly, got close enough to try a shot with his bow. He had missed that time and had missed many more, but he saw them. He saw the little fat shapes with the pointed heads sitting in the brush all over the place. Time and again he drew, held, and let arrows fly, but he still had no feathers on the arrows and they were, a, they were little more than sticks that flopped out of the bow, sometimes going sideways. Even when a bird was seven or eight feet away, the arrow would turn without feathers to stabilize it and hit a brush and hit brush or a twig. After a time, he gave up with the bow. It had worked all right for the fish when they came right to the end of the arrow, but it wasn't good for any kind of distance, at least not the way it was now. But he had carried his fish spear, the original one with the two prongs, and he moved the bow to his left hand and carried the spear in his right. He tried throwing the spear, but he was not good enough and not fast enough. The birds could fly amazingly fast, get up fast. But in the end, he found that if he saw the bird sitting and moved sideways toward it, not directly toward it, but at an angle, back and forth, he could get close enough to put the spear point out ahead almost to the bird and thrust lunge with it. He came close twice and then, down along the lake, not far from the beaver house, he got his first meat. The bird had sat, and he had lunged, and the two points took the bird back down into the ground and killed it almost instantly. It had fluttered a bit, and Brian had grabbed it and held it in both hands until he was sure it was dead. Then he picked up the spear and the bow and trotted back around the lake to his shelter, where the fire had burned down to the glowing coals. He sat looking at the bird, wondering what to do. With the fish, he had just cooked them whole, left everything in and picked the meat off. This was different. He would have to clean it. It had always been so simple at home. He would go to the store and get a chicken, and it was all cleaned and neat, no feathers or insides, and his mother would bake it in the oven and he would eat it. His mother, from the old time, from the time before, would bake it. Now he had the bird, but he had never cleaned one, never taken the insides out or gotten rid of the feathers, and he didn't know where to start. But he wanted the meat, had to have the meat, and that drove him. In the end, the feathers came off easily. He tried to pluck them out, but the skin was so fragile that it pulled off as well. So he just pulled the skin off the bird, like peeling an orange, he thought, sort of. Except that when the skin was gone, the insides fell out the back end. He was immediately caught in a cloud of raw odor, a 
a kind of steamy dung odor that came up from the greasy coil of insides that fell from the bird, and he nearly threw up. But there was something else to the smell as well, some kind of richness that went with his hunger and that overcame the sick smell. He quickly cut the neck with his hatchet, cut the feet off the same way, and in his hand he held something like a small chicken with a dark, fat, thick breast and small legs. He set it up on some sticks on the shelter wall and took the feathers and insides down to the water, to his fish pond. The fish would eat them, or eat what they could, and the feeding action would bring more fish. On second thought, he took out the wing and tail feathers, which were stiff and long and pretty, banded and speckled in browns and grays and light reds. There might be some use for them, he thought, maybe work them onto the arrows somehow. The rest he threw in the water, saw the small round fish begin tearing at it, and washed his hands. Back at the shelter, the flies were on the meat and he brushed them off. It was amazing how fast they came. But when he built up the fire and the smoke increased, the flies almost magically disappeared. He pushed a pointed stick through the bird and held it over the fire. The fire was too hot. The flames hit the fat and the bird almost ignited. He held it higher, but the heat was worse. And finally, he moved it to the side a bit and there it seemed to cook properly except that it only cooked on one side and all the juice was dripping off. He had to rotate it slowly and that was hard to do with his hands, so he found a forked stick and stuck it in the sand to put his cooking stick in. He turned it and in this way he found a proper method to cook the bird. In minutes the outside was cooked and the odor that came up was almost the same as the odor when his mother baked chickens in the oven, and he didn't think he could stand it, but when he tried to pull a piece of the breast meat off, the meat was still raw inside. Patience, he thought. So much of this was patience, waiting and thinking and doing things right. So much of all this, so much of all living was patience and thinking. He settled back, turning the bird slowly, letting the juices go back into the meat, letting it cook and smell and smell and cook, and there came a time when it didn't matter if the meat was done or not. It was black on the outside and hard and hot, and he would eat it. He tore a piece from the breast, a sliver of meat, and put it in his mouth and chewed carefully, chewed as slowly and carefully as he could to get all the taste, and he thought, Never, never in all the food, all the hamburgers and malts, all the fries or meals at home, never in all the candy or pies or cakes, never in all the roasts or steaks or pizzas, never in all the submarine sandwiches, never, never, never had he tasted anything as fine as that first bite. First meat.